What if I told you that Sabaody spoiled the vast majority of Egghead? You're skeptical, I get it. Give me some time and see if you still feel the same way. Hey YouTube, Joeboy here. So, I'd argue page for page, no arc was better than Sabaody. It was the last island of paradise and the Struts found themselves in the lion's den. This is where all the paths converge, and we finally were introduced to the other players, the other famous pirates who had managed to conquer paradise. So in this way, it really felt as if the strats had made it. They had proved something. Zabaody was an opportunity for the strats to demonstrate that they aren't just one of many. They were the best. Everybody else got by cutting corners, but the strats did not. They had defeated two warlords. They had wrecked havoc on Eni's lobby, and they had found something in the sky that only Gold Roger had found prior. But we had also been warned that there were forces that the strats were not yet capable of defeating. The end of Thuler Bark was a warning. Kuma arrived after they defeated Gekko Moria, and they were incredibly fortunate to not have been decimated right then and there. It was never a question at the time of whether they could defeat Kuma. It was simply a dawning reality that eventually there would become too many enemies for the strats to defeat at once. But of course, individual threats lurked as well, the admirals. It was given to us with absurd clarity that the strats were in no position to defeat a marine admiral because of their encounter with Aokiji. So there were still obstacles to be feared. Moria prepared readers for this as well. You think things have been tough so far? The real nightmare is waiting in the new world. All of these things blended together so perfectly, where you knew that the strats were going to do something outrageous, something absolutely insane, because that's who they were. But you feared the consequences of provoking something that they were not quite ready for. Then there was the setting, Sabaody itself, an amusement park as a poor facade, unable to conceal the darkness which surrounded it in close proximity to the Holy Land Mary Schwa and the introduction of the Celestial Dragons. At this time, the Celestial Dragons were by far the most outspokenly evil organization in the story. These were the most powerful people in the world, and because of this power, they did not fear consequences. They could murder in cold blood those that looked at them the wrong way. Slavery, which was supposed to be illegal, was something that they flaunted, and it was made all the worse because it was clear that they did not deserve the power that they possessed. They had earned nothing and weren't even individually strong themselves. It was simply known that if you harmed them, one of the great powers of the world, an admiral, would find you and you would lose. All of this created a contradiction. It put the strats in a unique circumstance. I felt like it was the first time in the story that the strats weren't truly free. Before they'd gone where they wanted and essentially had done what they'd wanted. But tempting an admiral was probably too much. So they were forced to watch this evil run around unchecked. We all knew it could never last. Luffy can't be controlled. And as it is consistently through the story, it's when his friends are in danger. So eventually we got the moment that we all wanted and feared. Luffy punched a celestial dragon. He proved that he was the craziest SOB there. And at the same time, he invited an absolute shitstorm, which broke the pattern of the story up until then. The Straw Hats effectively lost. There were, in fact, powers in this world that they were not yet ready to face. We've said this many times over the last few months of chapter reactions to Egghead, that Egghead has many similarities to Sabaody. Oda loves parallels and inversions. He uses them everywhere in the story, and many arcs pre-time skip have a sort of counterpart post-time skip. Fishman Island is a natural progression of everything that occurred in Arlong Park. Dressrosa is very similar to Alabasta. Even something like Punk Hazard, I feel like is an escalation of Drum Island. And this is physically represented as the island is not just extremely cold, but also boiling hot. Drum Island explored the science of healing, while Punk Hazard explored the science of death. Oda intends for us to compare these arcs and these themes. He gives us the tools to compare because of similarities. The same or similar building blocks are used, but often Often to construct different things. So all of this is just a really long intro. I want to talk about the comparison between Sabaody and Egghead. We're over 30 chapters into this arc and it still feels like a puzzle that we have yet to solve, even if the pieces are already there. So I want to utilize these established parallels, explain them in great detail, and potentially find the answer hiding in plain sight. Remember to like the video, subscribe, click the bell to be notified. You guys already know, right? And let's begin. 
Egghead just the same as Sabaody, both marks the end of one adventure and the beginning of the next. Luffy and the crew arrive having accomplished something. They've conquered something. In Sabaody, it was paradise. And in Egghead, it's the Yonko Saga. Luffy has acquired a new fancy title, from Supernova to Yonko. And this title carries new expectations. Readers want to see the strats prove that they've earned it, that they are once again the best of the best. And Oda helps accomplish this feeling by panning elsewhere. We see a continuation of other Supernova's adventures, those Supernova that Luffy was originally compared to at the conclusion of Paradise. Law and Kid both survived the Yonko Saga along with Luffy. Their bounties are similar to Luffy's, but within Egghead, both Kid and Law lose, giving fans what they want, seemingly an acknowledgement that the strats have risen above them all. This may not be true, but I certainly believe it to be true. The rivalry setup in Sabaody is over. But you know, part of this may be jumping the gun because Egghead has not ended yet. In Sabaody, we knew that there were enemies that the strats were not yet ready to encounter. But following Wano, the expectation is, is that the strats have reached the pinnacle. There is nobody that they cannot defeat. Oda hammers this in as Luffy has a very clear Rayleigh moment here in Egghead. Just the same as Rayleigh was able to step in and fight against Kizuru while the strats were struggling, now Luffy can perform that role. He has surpassed the teacher. The visual comparison of these two scenes speaks for itself. In a way, the strats represent the celestial dragons from Sabaody. There is no consequences to be feared. They are now the ones that truly possess freedom to do what they want, how they want. Just the same as Sabaody, Egghead is government territory. Just the same as Sabaody, the government and these celestial dragons feel as if they can kill whoever they want. And their target is Vegapunk. Vegapunk, who is essentially a slave. He may not be recognized as this, he may not be called this, but the metaphorical collar around his neck is evident. The world government and these celestial dragons have been using him. They've been riding him his work and his inventions. And as he attempts to remove his shackles, they are set to explode. So in a way, as we are following Kuma and his events outside of Egghead, I think that there's a lot of similarity with Vegapunk. Slaves who are attempting to break free, facing imminent consequences. But we're left with a question for Kuma. In Sabote, he felt more free, more in control. But was he doing what he wanted then, or is he doing what he wants now? As the Supernova's adventure has seemingly concluded, is Kuma doing the same? But if you read between the lines, this concept of freedom isn't just representative of Kuma and possibly Vegapunk. We see this very heavenly demonstrated with Admiral Kizaru. He describes himself as a cog in the machine. He plainly lays out what it is that he actually wants and then laments it's not what he can have because he doesn't have a say. He doesn't get a choice. It's really easy to understand how Sabaody relates to slavery in a straightforward, archaic way. But I really think that Egghead is the same. These government pawns aren't called that, but that is what they are. And it's just so interesting how Oda manipulates the same sort of characters that were involved in Sabaody, Sintamaru and Kizaru, but has also evolved their story. The journey has continued, and we see them from another perspective. Sabaody was the arc which introduced the pacifist, and Egghead, this has continued. We've seen the next version of them with the Seraphim. I think in the past we'd like to think that, hey, these inventions are very different from the actual characters that are subservient to the government. But in my mind, Oda has added context here in Egghead. Kizaru, Sentamaru, and Vegapunk were never better than pacifist. All of them are simply tools of these celestial dragons. But anyway, continuing forward, it should be insanely obvious that Saturn Agorose is a celestial dragon, and he represents celestial dragons for from Sabaody, such as Charlos. That is the intended comparison. Those that look at a celestial dragon in the eyes without permission die. But it's also different. Oda has escalated this plot because the Gorosei are not the same as, as a character like Charlos. He's given them teeth because Saturn is legitimately strong. But let's take a deep breath and take a step back. Really, this is a lot of information. There's a lot of comparisons to be made. At this point, it's pretty abundantly clear that there's something related between the two arcs. But like, how can we use this, right? What's the point of all this? And you know, it's interesting that I started recording this video before chapter 1094, and 1094 probably gives us our best example of really what this video is trying to convey. I believe that you can use Sabaody to make predictions about Egghead. So I think it would be informative to look at scenes which occurred in Sabaody Odi that don't have an obvious comparison yet with events in Egghead and make predictions based off of them. One of the cooler bits of world building from Sabaody was the environment, the mangrove trees, and the bubbles that naturally were produced by them. They utilize these bubbles in order to travel around. This heavily, heavily reminds me of the bubbles that these seraphim are currently trapped in in Egghead. 
But the secret of the bubbles and Sabaody is that they could only exist around the island itself. If you traveled too far away or too high up in the air, they popped. And this was explained as you basically had to stay within the climate of Sabaody for the bubbles to work. Likewise, I believe that the bubbles which contain the Seraphim will also pop. Freeing the Seraphim just appears like a good idea for the Ark. Certainly, it would ramp up the stakes and the tension immensely because they had difficulty dealing with them when they didn't have everything else to worry about. But the question, of course, is how exactly the bubbles are going to pop and when. As it appears to me, these bubbles appear to be very, very similar to the actual bubbles that were in Sab Odi, but those bubbles could only exist around the mangrove. How are they here in Egghead? My guess is, is it has something to do with Vegapunk's climate control technology, which is revealed a huge component of the Egghead Island itself. Vegapunk has utilized some knowledge about Sabaody and recreated it in the climate of Egghead. It's been established that the government does not want to damage the island. Everything is valuable. But I think that because of the scale of the battle that is about to unfold, the island will be destroyed. And at the same time, so will the climate device. Depending on how this is paced, this could end up being incredibly interesting. Just because we saw at the end of chapter 1094 that the pacifista are now under the direct command of Saturn. I don't think that Saturn is dead. But what this would mean is that Saturn now possesses the bubble technology, which is stated to act a lot like sea stone and has anti-devil fruit properties. So an interesting twist would be if the bubbles are used on our heroes, particularly hero devil fruit users such as Luffy. Luffy in old man form is vulnerable. So it's certainly a thought that has occurred to me. Luffy gets caught. And if that happens, the bubbles definitely need to be popped, which I think would be the destruction of the climate device. Potentially something like the Iron Giant could do that. We know that Blackbeard or the Blackbeard Pirates are present in Egghead. And it's interesting that there's two roles from Sabaody that they could potentially play. The first is as a parallel to the supernova. Sabaody established that Luffy had rivals, others that sort of accomplished the same thing that he did. The Grand Line selected for just a few who were contemporaries. A mostly forgotten detail is Blackbeard is very similar to the Eleven Supernova. In fact, he basically is a supernova except for the fact that he was not present in Sabaody. Collectively, the Eleven Supernova plus Blackbeard are known as the worst generation. So to me, it's fitting that the one guy who was not in Sabaody is here in Egghead. At this point, none of the other members of the worst generation matter in the story as much as Luffy does, except for Blackbeard. Oda's intention could be to utilize Egghead in the same way as Sabaody, essentially establish a new rivalry. But Blackbeard of the Blackbeard Pirates can also play the role of bounty hunters. This was another small element of Sabaody, but it was incredibly lawless. Human traffickers were everywhere. And a guy named Peterman sneakily captured Kami while the strats were distracted. Oda has foreshadowed for hundreds of chapters now that many different parties and groups, factions, would be interested in Nico Robin. Blackbeard being here, potentially with Katarina Devon, I think are an incredibly big threat to Robin. Devon can shapeshift and transform and catch Robin unawares. But yeah, whether or not you believe this, I think that you have to acknowledge its possibility, right? Robin could have a Kami moment and it could certainly make sense. But a part of me also loves the idea of a drastic inversion, right? Like the whole thing in Sabaody is that they were the slave owners. So it would be interesting if Blackbeard actually captured Saturn and made Saturn his slave. Oda has certainly hammered in the idea that Blackbeard is looking to acquire pieces in order to trade with the government and acquire things. That's why he captured Kobe, and if Garp is alive, that is why. It would certainly be an incredible flex for Blackbeard to capture Saturn, but depending on how Saturn is power scaled, which is at this point unclear, right? He could just be, you know, Yonko level, and that would make less sense. But thematically, it hits like a truck. Blackbeard's abilities are a natural counter to any strong devil fruit user. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth here though. All I want to really convey to you is that this idea of bounty hunters and capturing enslaving people was present in Sabaody. Blackbeard could potentially play this role in Egghead in some interesting way. And Sabaody, Zoro strolled past a celestial dragon. They met eyes. The celestial dragon was going to shoot him and Zoro nearly murdered the dude. He was stopped and in a way protected by Jewelry Bonnie. Well guys, this scene has clearly been inverted in the most recent chapter as Jewelry Bonnie is facing encountering a celestial dragon and literally stabbed him with a sword if you needed any more convincing. I think that it would be fitting if roles were reversed once again and Zoro some way somehow manages to rescue Bonnie. If I were to predict this visually, Zoro tackles Bonnie and she accidentally uses her powers on him so that Zoro looks like a child. 
There's also a throwaway line in Sabote after Luffy punches a celestial dragon. We pan to Zoro and Zoro has his sword partially unsheathed and he says, if it weren't for Luffy, he would have cut the celestial dragon himself. Definitely some food for thought. I understand that this is a very abstract thought, but I think that the Iron Giant is supposed to play a role similar to Rayleigh. Rayleigh was a member of the Pirate King's crew, but most importantly in Sapa Odi, he acts to tease the true history and adds needed support when the strats require it most. So similar to Rayleigh, I believe that the Iron Giant was once a member of a Pirate King's crew, not the Pirate King Gold Roger, but the Pirate King Joy Boy. Similar to Rayleigh, the Iron Giant begins his arc essentially imprisoned, overlooked, run down, and old, past his prime. Just like Rayleigh, however, he will wake up and make his presence known, likely demonstrating some kind of power that we've never seen before. But like I said, most importantly is the Iron Giant is a bearer of history, whether this is intentional or knowledge-based or simply its existence. Through it, the question of the missing history will come up once again, and we might learn something. One of the big things that Rayleigh revealed was that Roger couldn't read the Poneglyphs. He possessed the ability to hear the voice of all things. This concept has largely been forgotten and lost since Zoe, so it could be fitting for it to return. I wonder if Luffy will be able to hear the Iron Giant's voice, or similar to Momonosuke and Zunisha, issue it commands. I failed to mention this before, but this is another parallel that's already bore fruit in the Egghead arc. There's a very small moment with Garp where he learns that Silver's Rayleigh is present on the island. Garp learns that Silver's Rayleigh is captured, and he decides to deal with it himself and not tell anybody else. Garp's reasoning here is that the Marines' hands are full. They're about to deal with Whitebeard, a legend, and so they have to be very careful dealing with another legend in Rayleigh. Ultimately, this is how after Luffy punches a celestial dragon, he and the other supernova are surrounded by Marines. But the very clear parallel here is Garp going to rescue Kobe, choosing to do so alone and not tell anybody else. And part of the circumstances which surround this is the Marines are stretched thin at the moment. They're trying to deal with too much. And this is also an example of an escalation because in Sabaody, Garp learned about Rayleigh, but didn't actually involve himself in anything that occurred there. Whereas in Egghead or in Hachinosu, he actually went there. And it's also an inversion because Silver's Rayleigh was a legendary pirate, whereas Kobe is an upcoming Marine. Both captured and enslaved, but the circumstances are opposite. So basically, Oda took the potential of this small garp scene in Sabote and more so delivered on it in Egghead. One of the most memorable moments of Sabote was when St. Charlos shot Hachi. In my opinion, Vegapunk will play a similar role as Hachi. In the recent chapters, Oda has really conveyed how much regret Vegapunk has for the things that he feels responsible for, and among these is Jewelry Bonnie. Hachi goes to the slave auction with the intention of rescuing Kami, who has just been purchased by a celestial dragon. In my opinion, this is about to be proven or disproven very quickly, but we see in the recent chapters Vegapunk is trying to go rescue Bonnie, Bonnie who is face to face with a celestial dragon. I believe that Vegapunk will intervene and Saturn will kill him. As this was the government's goal all along, it would be very fitting. But the ramifications of this could be insane. I think that if you asked most people, especially with the context of this whole video, you would expect Luffy to have the same moment that he had in Sabote, where he punches a celestial dragon. This moment followed the celestial dragon shooting Hachi. So obviously this could occur again. The Celestial Dragon attempts to or actually kills Vegapunk and then Luffy punches him. But I find myself wondering about Kizaru. We've already speculated that Vegapunk is a parallel of the slaves of Sabaody. He has a collar on his neck that can't be seen, but will explode. This arc is about free will. Vegapunk will choose death rather than continued enslavement. Likewise, there's a lot of similarities with Kuma, whose journey we are also following. It was thought that he had lost all autonomy, but suddenly he is moving on his own. I understand that this is controversial, but I see Kizaru in the very same way. He is essentially a slave. And so I wonder, just the same as Kuma and Vegapunk, whether or not he will attempt to break his chains and finally decide to fight for what it is that he actually wants. Honestly, guys, to me, it wouldn't be absolutely crazy. It could actually happen that Kizaru is the one to punch Saturn after he kills Vegapunk. 
It's just another inversion which would hit like a truck. Ultimately, Oda has laid enough pieces in my opinion for Kizuru to essentially have had enough. And while we haven't addressed this in the video, Sabaody is not the only arc which is paralleled with Egghead. Ohara's flashback is another big one, very overt. And in Ohara, Jaguar Desol sacrificing himself for Robin mattered to Aokiji. In the same way, Vegapunk sacrificing himself for Bonnie could be similar. After getting shot, Hachi could only cry and blame himself for everything that occurred. Likewise, you could see Vegapunk do the same thing. He's unintentionally responsible for all of this death and destruction. Bonnie's circumstances are his fault. I think Vegapunk might regretfully cry, and I'm curious if this could have an effect on Kizuru. But if this is too much for you, just consider the circumstances of that moment in Sab Odi. Hachi getting shot, and then Luffy punching a celestial dragon. I would expect that to come up sometime soon, if it comes up at all. This is another very abstract thought, but one that's persuasive to me. I kind of wonder whether Big News Morgans plays the role of the Flying Fish Riders from Sabaody. Both Morgans and the Flying Fish Riders were prior enemies, which have suddenly become fans of the Straw Hats. And both Morgans and the Flying Fish Riders act as experts. They understand how the world works, so to speak. But in Egghead, we've gotten consistent updates from Big News Morgans. Oda is making sure that we understand that he's following along with the drama in Egghead. And as he's listening with a Black Din and Mushi, I wonder whether Big News Morgans actually wants to see what unfolds on the island himself. Is Big News Morgans heading for Egghead? Certainly, I think that this would make sense. If for no other reason, then this becomes an incredibly important event in One Piece world history. The Egghead Incident. For this to be the case, I would presume that the world would need to, in some form, be able to see it. Big News Morgans can perform this role. And at the same time, just the same as the Flying Fish Riders, Big News Morgans flies around. I was talking to Randy Train. He has a One Piece Theory video about Math Piece. I'll go ahead and link it in the description. But essentially, his speculation is that Vivi will return to the story, encounter the Straw Hats, exactly 1,000 chapters after her debut. So basically, I could see Morgans involve himself in Egghead essentially as a fan of the Strats and overall drama slot. Just like the Flying Fish Riders, he will do something to assist the Strats in their escape. And simultaneously, he could return Vivi to the Strahd crew. Another very low-key element of Sabaody was that it emphasized elements of the underworld and that the pirates of the One Piece world worked with the government and the Celestial Dragons. The human auction house was owned by Doflamingo, and the Celestial Dragons allowed it to exist because they utilized it to purchase slaves themselves. So following this relationship and connection into the New World, right, this has been a big component of uh, many events. And more specifically, this has been sort of the journey of the Revolutionary Army in the story. They knew that the Celestial Dragons and World Government were working with pirates. They were a part of the Underworld. And by following the clues, it led them to Dressrosa and Doflamingo. But yeah, guys, I'm convinced. Eventually, Oda is going to have the Revolutionary Army utilize this information. They've been following the, the things that the government has been doing, the illegal things, and they will reveal it to the world. My prediction is that this will occur in Egghead. There is a reason why, during the course of this arc, we are following along with the Revolutionary Army. I believe that Lolosia having just been destroyed, the government unveiling this weapon, will force the Revolutionary Army's hand. The world absolutely needs to know the danger that they are in, when islands can suddenly disappear. So basically guys, I can see the plot thread, which essentially began in Sabaody, just the same as the Supernova, just the same as Kuma, concluding here. Sabaody thematically represented the government, a facade which barely hides encroaching darkness. Likewise, this very same theme is shared in the arcs of Skypea, as well as Dressrosa. And El, of course, was a god similar to the Celestial Dragons and Doflamingo the same. Both of their countries attempted to hide their evil. On the surface level with Sabote, you had the hotels, the tourism, the park itself. This is the gift, the joy that the government has created. And beneath the surface in the same place, you have the human auction house. So Sabote establishes the shadows and Egghead might finally shine a light on the true nature of the world government. But I'm sure that many of you guys were wondering through the course of this video how we're going to end it. Because with Sabote, there's a particular feel to that arc, especially at the end. The strats 
they lost. And frankly, I find it incredibly difficult to speculate the same thing occurring in Egghead. But I will say this, as of the current chapters in Egghead, it's finally reaching a point where it feels like the strats could potentially lose. And this is definitely something shared with Sabote. We entered Sabote with a lot of confidence and a feeling of carelessness, invulnerability. That is what the story had taught us up until that point, that no matter the odds, these strats would win time and time again. Defeat was never a question. So the beginning of Sabaody is very similar to the beginning of Egghead, and I think that we as fans simply wanted the strats to prove themselves uh, and really just cause trouble because people were being evil, and it would find a way to work itself out. But then Sabaody flipped and became something else entirely. Suddenly the battlefield was flooded with too many powerful opponents, and personally my confidence wavered. First it was the pacifista in Sentomaru, Kizuru was there, then a warlord, Kuma. And I think that Oda could recreate some of these feelings in Egghead. That this is potentially too much for the Strahads. Like frankly guys, what the world government has brought to Egghead is very much akin to an entire Yonko crew. And this contributes to the feeling of Egghead which is very similar to Sabaody that our objective is not to defeat them, it is to escape. But will they? From the context of this video, I do think that it is a question. Another very low-key parallel is that preceding Sabaody, of course we had Thriller Bark, and Zoro took all of Luffy's pain, leaving him greatly nerfed for what is to come. It's been only a few days since Wano, and Zoro underwent very similar circumstances. I wouldn't be surprised to see Oda confirm that Zoro is still injured. But it's really just this question, am I going to speculate? Do I believe that the strats lose here in Egghead? Surprising, obviously many people would not agree, but the same thing occurred in Sabote. Oda loves twisting the story when you expect it least. But despite saying that, I would say that no, I do not believe the strats will lose. For now, anyway. Because it's not just about paralleling events. It is about predicting what Oda will do with those parallels. Inversions are just as common. I think in Thriller Bark, Oda established that the strats weren't ready yet, and that we should be preparing for forces that they can't deal with. But Wano's messaging was exactly opposite. The strats are ready, and no matter the odds, they will win. But really, I just wanted to leave this as a question. We've gone through all the parallels, we've speculated additional ones, and this one looms large. Will Egghead conclude like Sabaody or not? Anyway guys, I really just wanted to make this video because it's just so obvious that Egghead is paralleled with Sabaody, and we really only have until the next few chapters, I would guess, to speculate based off of it. And it's also a convenient way to discuss some of these parallels and add intrigue to it. Could some of these scenes come up again? And if they do, how are they the same and how are they potentially different? But you guys already know, I'm curious as to what you think, your opinions, share them in the comment section below. Feel free to check out my books, The Booms, Volume 1, 2, and 3 are all out. And if you guys happen to read them, please just let other people know what you thought about them. Leave a review. Remember to like, subscribe, click the bell to be notified, join the squad. And as always, guys, have a wonderful day.